Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual book launch for Professor Thomas C. Holt's new book called The Movement, The African-American Struggle for Civil Rights. Um, this event is presented in partnership with the Seminary Co-op Bookstores and the University of Chicago Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. My name is Marina Malazonia, and I'm the marketing manager at the Seminary Co-op Bookstores. As some of you may know, uh, the co-op is two bookstores on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park. Our stores were founded in 1961, and in 2019, they became the first non-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. And this cultural mission allows us to keep over 100,000 books on our shelves and work with like-minded cultural partners like <clears throat> CSRPC to ensure events like this. And tonight's event is moderated by Roshana Johnson. Roshana is Associate Professor of US History at the University of Chicago. Professor Johnson's research focuses on the African diaspora, women and gender studies, and the history of slavery, primary in Louisiana and the US South. I will now turn it over to Roshana to introduce Professor Thomas C. Holt. Good evening, everyone. I have the honor of introducing Professor Tom Holt, who is James Westfall Thompson Professor Emeritus of American and African American History at the College at, at UChicago. He has a longstanding professional interest in comparing the experiences of people in the African diaspora, particularly those in the Caribbean and the United States. The recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, he is also the author of many publications, including the award-winning The Problem of Freedom, Race, Labor, and Politics in Jamaica and Britain, 1832 to 1938, Black Over White, Negro Political Leadership in South Carolina During Reconstruction, Children of Fire, A History of African Americans, and The Problem of Race in the 21st Century. Most recently, he is the author of The Movement, The African-American Struggle for Civil Rights. I will turn things over to Professor Holt, after which I look forward to an engaging conversation. Thank you very much, Roshana. Um, the, um, I've been asked to give some sense of um, uh, what this book is about. Uh, and I think one place to start is how I came to, to write it. Uh, because I think they, those things are, are intertwined uh, in certain ways. Um, part of it is that I was, as will be evident to anybody reading the book, um, um, a participant in the civil rights uh, uh, movement, uh, mainly working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, which began when um, demonstrations began in my hometown of Danville, Virginia, which was shortly after, uh, about a month or so after the uh, demonstrations in Birmingham in 1963. And, um, and later I worked with Smith in Cambridge, Maryland as well. Um, so that was a backdrop and it really informs, I guess, my take on the movement. I draw a lot, of course, on much of the literature and there's a very rich literature by this time uh, on the movement in different places, um, but that the, uh, the basic themes of it actually come out of uh, a sort of a combination, I guess you might say, of my, my own personal experience in the movement um, and what I learned from my fellow historians who have written about places that I was not present at and did not uh, know the terrain as well. Uh, the, but despite that, I'd not actually thought about writing a book about the civil rights movement. Somehow it seemed a bit too personal, too close. Um, I did, of course, in my years of teaching African-American history, uh, of course, would talk about the movement and noticed over time um, a kind of um, interesting change over time and my students' understanding and appreciation of the movement. Uh, when I first started teaching, which is long ago than I want to actually admit, but it was back in the 70s, um, let's say, and many students, of course, had either themselves had experience directly or their siblings or parents had. Uh, it was still very close 
in terms of a, um, a kind of knowledge, uh, that is everyday knowledge of what happened, uh, what it was about. But over time, of course, that, that changes. As new generations you know, uh, of students, um, in some sense, the movement became, uh, it could have been as easily the reconstruction period or the American Revolution in terms of their own connection to it. And so did their perceptions of it. Um, in a strange way, uh, although we celebrate the movement in many respects in, um, um, you know, in the Black History Month and, and the connection with Martin Luther King's birthday, there come to be a notion that at, what I took as a misapprehension of what the movement was about uh, and what it achieved. Um, and there was a, a great deal of skepticism, actually, among students by the time I was teaching in the late, uh, in the 1890s, early 21st century. Um, and there was a parallel change, I think, in how a new generation of historians interpreted the movement. Um, there was a sense that somehow uh, at least in my own reading, that it was kind of a wrong turn from um, a set of revolutionary possibilities that had emerged in the 40s, where uh, uh, civil rights activities were more focused on um, labor and uh, labor mobilization, and that somehow uh, a movement or activities uh, or resistance based on sitting at a lunch counter or getting a seat on a bus was somehow not as, um, what shall we say, certainly as, as uh, important uh, or as, and certainly not radical. Um, and that's not, of course, how I experienced that period. Um, but I still was not particularly, you know, thinking about writing a book about the movement until um, sometime, uh, uh, actually not that long ago, my mother told me the story of my grandmother, um, her mother, and how in 1944, uh, she uh, uh, did what, what the family called the kind of Rosa Parks uh, moment. Uh, where she refused to uh, uh, surrender a seat on a bus that was uh, 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 actually was a, a bus that was traveling from the uh, uh, city of Lynchburg to, to Danville at that, uh, that moment. Um, she was not arrested, unlike uh, some other people during that period. But it started me thinking, you know, uh, that this notion of um, you know, what motivates people, what moves people to take great risks was something that was very close to me. Um, and uh, that as I thought about her story and how she could have come to take that action, it seemed to me to provide a kind of way of framing my own um, perspective on both the motivation and the nature of the movement that emerged in the 1950s and, uh, and the 60s. Um, that there were changes both in terms of the socioeconomic context in which she could take that risk. Um, um, and I talk about that at some length in the book about the um, uh, the uh, really the breakdown of the uh, means of racial control, which were uh, you know, also related to the fact that Black Americans up until that time were heavily concentrated in, in the South in agriculture, um, which is not simply a matter of the, the nature of the job, but the nature of, of, of life that people, uh, uh, not only their livelihood, but their ability to uh, 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 control their lives 
is very much under the control of a um, employer who's often also your landlord. Um, and that when that begins to break down, which had happened in my family, the family that had been farmers that were no longer working on the farm, it opened up uh, a set of possibilities for resistance that had not been as uh, prevalent before. And so that becomes a major theme in the, the book. Um, the other is that I think something is discounted in thinking about the movement, and especially when people think, well, you know, uh, sitting at a lunch counter or, or refusing to surrender a seat on a bus is not very, you know, uh, not very radical. Um, of thinking of, in the personal terms of what goes into bringing people to take a step that could in fact put them in great physical danger as well as obviously being arrested and coming in to uh, conflict with the law. And so I wanted to get that story out as well. And I thought that story of my grandmother was uh, in, in some ways inspired me to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to use that as an opening onto what was at stake for people and what was motivating people uh, at that moment in time. So um, that basically, uh, those are basically some of the themes or the basic themes of the, of the, of the book. The other uh, is the very fact that it was my grandmother. Um, I was somewhat, um, uh, I wanna say ashamed, but certainly uh, uh, taken back to realize that I'd never, thought about the fact that the people overwhelmingly involved in demonstrations and in protests were often women like my grandmother. I mean, not as old as she was. She was 66 when she had her uh, sit-in, if you will. But, uh, but yeah, people of, uh, of women and girls of, uh, of all ages were very much a part of the movement. And that underscored something else that I wanted to, uh, uh, theme I wanted to, to, to draw in this book was that the movement is based on the uh, ordinary people uh, who are not the celebrated you know, uh, leaders and certainly not the celebrated male leaders that we often associate the movement with, certainly today uh, in the ways that we, uh, uh, we remember it and recognize it, um, in particular in a period like, like now. I, I, I don't want to cut you off, are you? No, no, I, I, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Uh, I was trying to explain the various themes that, in fact, uh, uh, the motivation for the themes that are described or, uh, 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 examine in the book. And 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 I the theme about your grandmother in particular, I think, was incredibly striking because often I think many scholars, but certainly historians, are often reluctant to put those kinds of stories um, into print. And so it was incredibly rich and fascinating to see to have you know a, a scholar of your stature right open your account with that story. Um, and and so I guess we don't necessarily have to spend a whole lot of time here if you don't want to. But I just thought that that was just such an important and powerful way to claim a particular kind of story um, for historians in particular, and then also more broadly in terms of thinking about the way, you know, where we look uh, for sources of knowledge. Um, okay, but I will, I will move, I'll move quickly um, in the interest of time. Um, so, this is a compact book, but it does a lot. <laughs> um, and so I want to touch on a, to touch on a couple of the other themes that you didn't necessarily mention in your introductory remarks, but that you also bring up in the book. Um, mm -hmm. 
So one of the things that you take issue with, I think respectfully, but also pretty forcefully, um, is the scholarship on the long civil rights movement, right? And this idea that it stretches back into the early 20th century. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it was important for you to distinguish between this kind of long period of struggle, you know, this long history of black struggle that goes to the antebellum period, as you talk about in the first chapter, yeah. while also identifying something very particular and special and important about this decade from 1955 to 1960. That's exactly on point. Uh, the um, it's a kind of, I guess, a um, subtle point in some ways. Uh, as you say, uh, the book begins actually in the nineteen, the eighteen fifties, um, and describes um, various forms of protest that are um, very, many of them quite close to what we would see in the fifties and sixties. Uh, that is, you know, sit in on um, but within horse drawn bus uh, buses in um, both southern and the northern cities. Um, and there is, of course, a long history of struggle. But if one conflates that with the civil rights movement, it seems to me you, you have a, a difficult problem of of understanding the movement itself as this really quite special moment. And uh, while it continued, it used some of the same tactics that had been, um, uh, been uh, used before, uh, mass marches in the streets, uh, uh, that had happened before, uh, sit-ins, as I mentioned, boycotts, uh, none of that was new but in the context of the 1950s and 60s, it created a broad mass movement, a social movement. And that was not the case in these earlier moments. There were very important protests and very important uh, 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 acts of resistance. But they, if one wants to understand what the, um, the long civil long uh, civil rights movement is often associated with uh, Jacqueline Hall um, and in a very interesting and, and I think uh, a very good article um, uh, that she published back in the, uh, I think it'd be uh, sometime in the 90s. Um, but she also describes the movement, the so-called classic movement of it from about the Montgomery bus boycott through Selma as um, the most, um, I forget her exact phrasing, but the, you know, the most uh, important and significant development in, uh, in the 20th century. And if you conflate that, that it's the same as, or simply a continuation of uh, earlier developments, it's very hard to, you know, to tease out what happened then and why that you had this kind of uh, really um, uh, massive uh, 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 resistance uh, in, in scores of cities over a period of uh, more than a decade, in fact, uh, and that that is quite unique in the history of uh, the United States and certainly in the history of African-American resistance. It's interesting. I'd like to connect this to what you said before in terms of thinking about labor history and sort of labor activism and the connection to the civil rights movement and sort of thinking about some of the debates within the historiography. Uh, because there's another interesting thing that you do here, I think, in starting in that second chapter, which is where you fo focus on urbanization in the South. Um, because, and you see that as a kind of precondition to the mass in mass movement, right? And which I thought was just such an interesting point that I don't think gets a lot of attention, certainly beyond the field. Um, but, but because the great migration, we often think about movement to cities in other places, but at the same time, right, it's important to think about migration to cities across the South and how that was an incredibly important ingredient um, in kind of the production of this mass that would then be part of the mass movement. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the Southern city itself as an essential element um, in the early movement's history. Yeah, the, um, 
I think it's important to, uh, you know, to focus on a, a set of cities uh, which were the, the main site of movement activity. And they shared uh, a number of uh, social economic um, um, uh, uh, characteristics, um, whether they were large cities like Birmingham, uh, for example, or smaller cities like Selma or uh, Danville, uh, uh, they uh, were all places in which the, um, the forms of racial control had actually weakened, um, which is not to say, of course, there's not racial violence, there was not, and certainly there was police violence, uh, and that they were not, not racial oppression in various forms, but the kind of, you know, from, for at least a century after emancipation, slavery emancipation in the 1860s, the overwhelming majority of uh, Black Americans lived in the South and in the rural South. And they lived under conditions of labor and, uh, and of life that left very little room for you know, organized resistance like what uh, developed in the mid 20th century. Now, of course, there were, as we know, uh, 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 there was labor organization at, in various places at various times. Uh, Louisiana, for example, was one significant one place. Uh, the Brotherhood of Timber, uh, timber Workers, uh, farm workers organized in the 1890s. But by and large, there was very little room for that kind of uh, overt uh, resistance to the racial regime. Um, there, there was much greater risk, there was much greater control. Um, and in a place like Mississippi, as uh, Nan Woodruff has shown, you know, even uh, on these large plantations in the Delta, your, your mail was controlled by, you know, the, the, the planter. Often there was a post office on the plantation. Obviously your means of subsistence uh, was controlled by the, the company store. Um, so on and on and on. There was very little room to, to organize resistance. Once you get the great migration, which as you point out is also to Southern cities, um, then you begin to break that uh, set of controls. There's much greater possibility for uh, uh, all forms of, of mobilization. I mean, uh, just ordinary socialization. I mean, uh, in terms of say churches, in terms of the civic organization, uh, in terms of communication, and your residence, most important, your residence is not also your place of employment. And so uh, the, the possibility of mobilizing is much greater. And that becomes, that process has been going on since the 1890s into the mid 20th century, but certainly by or after, especially after World War II, it is uh, pretty far advanced in a number of Southern cities, uh, uh, including Birmingham, uh, which has a, a steel industry, or at least an iron work industry, uh, Montgomery, uh, Greensboro, all these places, Nashville, places that have uh, uh, significant uh, black populations that uh, are now at least have the possibility of, of uh, mobilizing uh, against the uh, racial regime. And so it was important to make that distinction, I think, as to where the movement began, to be able to explain where it began. And once you, the movement moved to Mississippi in the uh, mid 60s, uh, it faces an entirely different set of problems because Mississippi has been much less changed by all of these social forces. It is still very much rural, agricultural, large plantations, and they are breaking down, but they're not breaking down as fast as they are in places like North Carolina, Virginia, and so forth. And that is, you know, is, goes a long way to explaining both the uh, geography of the movement and, the, and its chronology. It begins in places like Montgomery and Greensboro and so forth, and then moves on to places like 
you know, Hattiesburg and uh, Meridian and so forth later on in Mississippi and in the rural parts of Alabama. Well, and I think one of the things that I found powerful in was that in decentering charismatic leaders, it really opened, it certainly broadened my capacity to appreciate sort of, as you say, the chronology of the movement, even within this compact period, this relatively sort of compact period, the different um, shifts that happened within that, de that decade um, and the way that, it, that by decentering people, we could get to a better understanding of the other kinds of tensions that actually emerged within the context of the movement. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you've already gestured toward this in terms of thinking about, you know, sort of what's different, you know, what separates Mississippi from, you know, you know other sites and so on. Um, but could you talk a little bit about um, the tension that you identify between people who really centered everyday organizing within Black communities um, versus those who, and, and this may be reductive, there may be some other, uh, you know, there, I know there are tensions within here, but, and, but tensions between people who favored organizing within Black communities and those who advocated the more spectacular acts of protest that were geared toward, um, you know, sort of televised and, and, and broader national, international yeah. audiences. Yeah, that's, um, I don't know how to come at that question, because it's a complex question, actually. It's, it's a complex, first of all, on the, on the, in terms of uh, movement strategy. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, in fact, the, um, um, uh, the, the notion of uh, how you mobilize a nation, it's, 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 which is resistant to, um, to change, um, to that is the nation as a whole, as opposed to you know the particular localities and the, and certainly the South. How do you get uh, uh, the federal government uh, to be on your side against the mayor of you know Birmingham or uh, the governor of Alabama? Uh, so it was. Uh, the strategy in some ways was to, in fact, show or expose the uh, brutalities of the system, uh, to, to put it very short, in, in short, uh, short uh, 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 and so the, uh, one of the problems about that is that by the time you get to trying to uh, deal with a place like uh, Mississippi um, and deeper structural problems like the problems that are posed to voting rights, for example, is that there are limitations in that strategy. And so I, I think that you were uh, gesturing toward the kind of uh, mobilizations that were um, uh, would come in the 1966, 67 uh, with the Black Power Movement, which would be uh, a much different orientation than the movement of, that began in, um, uh, with the sit-ins and with the uh, bus boycott uh, uh, almost a decade earlier. Um, I don't know if that gets you a question or not, but Oh, I guess that the other part too, I guess, is that uh, you're, you're right that there was also a sense throughout that period that you had to focus on uh, mobilizing communities uh, and making uh, the, uh, the people themselves their own leaders, uh, to focus on uh, that rather than having charismatic leaders like King and others come in and, and, and basically, uh, you know, rile them up and lead them off to, into uh, uh, marches that could be televised. That you had to change on the ground. Uh, and this is something that um, Ella Baker was particularly uh, uh, forceful in arguing that the movement had to always, if it's gonna build a movement, they had to build it from the ground up and not from the top down. So that was the other, tension that was uh, uh, evident in the movement throughout its, uh, uh, the, the decade or so. Um, 
And really quick, I have a few more questions prepared, but I want to invite participants in the audience to start to post questions into the chat because we have a Q&A um, period coming in a couple of minutes, and I want to make sure that we have uh, that we have questions from you so that we can um, get to as many of those as we can. Okay, um, so the civil rights movement um, is often considered a Southern phenomenon, um, but you know, as you write, right after Selma, veterans of the Southern movement came North. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the continuities and ruptures that define this part of the movement. Yeah. Um, one of the difficulties, in, in fact, in structuring the, uh, the story is that uh, the attention does shift to the South, because that's where it's spectacular and um, what do you say, television ready events are occurring. Um, and there's a tendency to forget that actually there was, the movement began in the North in some sense, um, in the 30s, in fact, and in the 40s, there were boycotts, uh, very uh, 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 significant boycotts in the 1930s of department stores uh, in, in Northern cities like Chicago. Uh, and like uh, Baltimore, Washington, and so forth. Um, and there was also, of course, a lot of uh, protest activity around school segregation uh, because schools in the North were segregated as well as those in the South. Um, and Chicago was one of the, uh, in fact, the centers of some of that, uh, that activity and that resistance. That didn't stop while the movement was happening in the South, but it got much less attention. And then once um, the Voting Rights Act had been achieved and attention began to shift to, especially to more economic issues, employment issues, um, and uh, other problems in, in the community, uh, other than the you know, amount of segregation which had been at least lessened, it wasn't, didn't disappear, but lessened with the passage of you know, civil rights legislation and so forth. Uh, then the North began to get more attention uh, and many of the um, uh, uh, organizations and leaders uh, who had been focused on the South, like Dr. King, who came to Chicago to lead uh, uh, a movement here. Um, and, uh, as well as indigenous, that is, people who are native of, you know, New York and Chicago and Detroit and, and other places, uh, Philadelphia, um, continue to carry out their, you know, their their efforts, but with a difference. Whereas before, they had, like in the South, focused on integration of education as a, a problem, uh, job discrimination as a problem to be addressed they became much more oriented toward uh, community control of school. Uh, so by the 19, uh, late 1960s, 1966, 67, uh, that was rather than integration of schools in say Chicago, it was to try to gain control. In fact, here in Hyde Park, there was a significant uh, project around that, uh, as well as in, um, in New York City. Um, so, uh, and as well as employment as well. So the issues uh, shifted as well as some of the, the, the leadership that began to uh, see the North as the new terrain of struggle. Um, unfortunately, many of those organizations did not, um, frankly, master uh, or uh, were not that successful. Uh, SCLC, for example, uh, despite Jesse Jackson, Push in Chicago was not generally successful in its uh, northern efforts, nor was SNCC uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, or CORE. Uh, so, uh, so there was a significant change, and in some ways, the the baton passed to political leaders because uh, what followed the Voting Rights Act, ironically, was not so much, at least immediately the election of, of, of uh, 
congressmen and mayors and so forth in the South, that did happen eventually, but rather in places again, like Cleveland, Detroit, New York, uh, and so forth. And so, um, so that became the front really of, and the, and the center of mobilization uh, around issues broadly uh, described as civil rights uh, by the late 60s uh, and, and, and into the 70s. Um, you also mentioned, and you, you've mentioned this in your introductory remarks, and you talk about it briefly in the book, um, but you, you talk about your own experiences with SNCC, your time at an institution that we I, both have in common, Howard. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, because, because you talk about the way that, that you know, by the late 60s, 70s, we see a lot of campus activism as well, college campuses as a site of activism, as well as intellectual production. And I'm thinking about the, the beautiful event hosted um, a couple of weeks ago that brought scholars from Howard and Spellman to um, virtually um, to campus to talk about um, the intellectual, the, 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 the importance of HBCUs, both in terms of what they do intellectually and in terms of political activism. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way that your experiences in those institutions have shaped your, perhaps your approach, perhaps specifically to your understanding of the civil rights movement, but also broadly in terms of thinking about your intellectual engagement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I, uh, again, I, I went to uh, college in the 1960s. Um, there was, uh, still, uh, basically, higher education is still fairly segregated, um, not necessarily by law, but by uh, some other uh, choices. Uh, and one of the benefits of that was that we had some pretty fantastic people teaching at places like Howard and uh, and Spellman and um, and you know and other and Fisk and so forth. Um, some of whom had themselves been shaped by some of the struggles I've referred to earlier from the 30s and 40s um, and early 50s. And so I think that was very important for my own uh, education. Um, and as you mentioned, how it, it turned, as it turned out, was uh, one of the uh, seedbeds, if you will, for um, uh, movement activity. Um, there was a local group uh, called the Nonviolent Action Group that was affiliated with SNCC on Howard's campus. And so many of us were drawn to that. Um, there were actually students were mobilized uh, on the campus to participate in some of the early uh, uh, movement activities, uh, demonstrations. Uh, I remember one of the first uh, protest I went on was to uh, sit-ins in restaurants in Baltimore, uh, and there was a lot of uh, activity uh, there um, um, that uh, students from Howard joined in uh, uh, those protests. Um, so it was a particularly, um, uh, what should I, word should I use, fertile period in terms of, uh, you know, uh, drawing one into uh, this kind of, of, um, of possibility uh, and this kind of uh, 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 expression of, of resistance to the, the, uh, the Jim Crow system. So, um, and of course, one could say that about uh, there are some other, uh, I mean, even Chicago, though, you know, there were only very few Black students, but one must remember that it was students at Chicago, uh, some students at Chicago in 1942 who staged sit-ins in the loop and actually in Hyde Park as well. Um, so uh, Bob Rustin, for example, was an engaged who becomes very important later in the movement. So uh, college campuses and particularly uh, those that were still predominantly black campuses were uh, really important seedbed um, and, and uh, point of mobilization and will continue to be throughout the, uh, throughout the movement. Um, 
one of the things about the cities that I talked about earlier, many of them were located near black college campuses. And uh, those were the people who filled out the ranks of people doing sit-ins or you know, uh, marches or whatever the case may be. Um, so, so that was very important to the early development of individuals and their transformation, but also in terms of the actual possibility of mobilizing uh, against uh, uh, segregated uh, facilities. I think I have time for about one more question before I want to move to the, the questions from the participants. And I think that this question will in some ways anticipate the first question from one of the participants. But in the end, in the chapter on, on legacies, um, you write, and I'm reading from page 116, uh, you write, um, let's see, where should I start? Freedom, you, it's quoting the, the song, right? Freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, I've struggled so long that I must be free. In a book that draws its title from this song, Angela Davis argues that depicting the movement as merely the work of heroic individuals risks leading future generations to misrecognize their own capacity to act collectively to achieve social justice, an observation that underscores the principal theme of this book. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that, right? About this book in this moment um, and, and what this book teaches us today. Um, well, I, I can take a stab at it, um, at least at my hope. Um, as I said at the outset, uh, I, one of the motivations for writing this book was that I felt that the civil rights movement in some respects is, is, has tended to be misperceived, at least in, in some popular thought. Uh, on the other hand, the much of the uh, mobilization that we see uh, today, especially this year, but also in the last uh, decade or so, um, mainly uh, around the theme of Black Lives Matter and variations on that theme, um, I think owes a lot to, um, uh, to that legacy. Uh, and, and that's sort of what I had in mind when I said that, you know, uh, the notion of freedom as a constant struggle. That is, it's not one in a single moment. It is a continuing uh, and uh, evolving and recurring um, uh, battle. And that's what we, I think, particularly this past year have seen are, are developments and scenes and a spirit that's very much like uh, that of, you know, the, the 1960s um, and 60, 61, particularly uh, when uh, young people were drawn into uh, the resistance movement in, in large numbers. Um, so the other thing though, is that it, at least my understanding of it, um, uh, and I, is that as in that moment, it is from the ground up. It's not so much that there is a, you know, uh, national leader who steps forward and, uh, and, and mobilizes people, but they are mobilized by their uh, direct experience uh, and revulsion uh, uh, with the conditions that they, perceived and especially events like some of the ones we saw last spring and summer um, uh, and that they come together and in, they're not anonymous but they're certainly not you know uh, uh, their power is in fact in their their collectivity and their, their collective struggle uh, as opposed to in uh, some top-down uh, kind of, um, of um, direction, which is often how you know these these things are perceived, but actually do not accord with the actual. And so it, I think uh, I quoted Angela Davis because I thought that for it perfectly captured uh, what I was trying to get at, that uh, 
if you think of it in terms of, as it often was referred to, Dr. King's movement, then you have to have a Dr. King for it to happen. But if you think of it as coming from the ground up, then each person uh, contributes to the whole. And that is in fact uh, how I saw the movement of the 60s. And I think uh, I see something similar in our own moment. Um, And, and so I would, I think what you just said anticipates this question and maybe, um, I, so I will pose it and, and then maybe you could think about sort of specific lessons here. So this is a question from the UChicago alum, Toussaint Lossier. Um, Professor Holt spoke about how his grandmother's resistance inspired this project, but it's also worth noting that we also find ourselves in a contemporary moment that thinks of itself having its movement and often through the civil rights struggle, how much did today's movement moment shape the writing of this book or more appropriately, what lessons might this history offer for the movement today? Yeah, I, I think basically, uh, uh, Certainly, there's some variation on the same uh, uh, answer I just gave. Um, that uh, this particular book is focused on trying to understand the movement of another moment, uh, mainly the 50s and 60s. Uh, but in understanding that, I think we can also have a perspective on what's happening today and what needs to happen. Um, and that. Uh, so basically, that's the uh, I think the both the rationale and the and the thematic of the of the book. And as we wait for additional questions, I certainly would like to invite more. I certainly have many more to go if people don't um, post more in the chat. But I would certainly like to defer to our panel to uh, our participants. Um, but I, I guess I kind of I wondered about that in terms of the structure of the book because it is a compact book. It is an accessible book, but it's also jam packed with obviously deep historical knowledge. And I was wondering if you wrote in this form. It, as a way of speaking to a larger audience beyond sort of professional academics and whether or not that decision to write in this accessible way, um, rigorous obviously, but still accessible, um, was informed by a desire to speak to the current moment. Well, yes, uh, certainly in part, um, in large part, uh, but I should confess that, you know, the, the, the length and compactness of the book is basically uh, a contractual. <laughs> it is part of a series at Oxford uh, University Press where uh, a book designed to reach a, a large audience, um, uh, a non-academic audience, uh, as well as to be useful in, in coursework. Um, so, uh, I'm con I was contractually limited to 135,000 words. So, <laughs> you know, so I had to decide what's gonna fit within that 135,000 words. Um, and I, th I think I came pretty close to 135,000 words. Uh, so the, uh, the practical answer is that, but also uh, I was attracted to the project because I wanted to write um, um, basically uh, a book of this nature, uh, as opposed to, there, there are many books out there, um, if you want a much more detailed uh, examination, say of Mississippi, uh, many of which I, I drew on, because uh, I knew less about Mississippi than some other parts of the movement, um, or on personalities, or on a number of issues. Uh, so this is not, a book in competition with them, but rather one for an audience that wants, you know, basically to have a, a grasp on the main theme, at least as I understand them, uh, and the main event uh, that made up the civil rights movement. Um, there are a lot that I'd be the first to admit that I could have talked about that's left out, but I had to make those decisions and, um, and I think uh, it suited me actually at this moment to write uh, this, this kind of, 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 um, of intervention. <laughs> 
as opposed to, I've written long books before. Uh, so I was happy to write a short book. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, so we have another question from another alum, Quincy Mills, um, quote, uh, what do you think are some ways historians can bridge movement goals of access, sit-ins, Brown, and structural change, guaranteed income and economic security. These were twin goals, but we tend to separate them with Watts, for example, as the break. Uh, I think that's the first, it was access. Um, so what do, you, what do you think are some ways historians can bridge movement goals of access, meaning sit-ins, Brown, and structural change, meaning guaranteed income and economic security? Um, well, and it was historians, you said? Yes, historians among, yeah. among historians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I think you have to bring both. And, 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 and I think, I, at least I tried to do that in this book, uh, while I, you know, be, I chart the beginning of the, what's called the classic civil rights movement around um, issues of access, uh, you might say, I think is really about human dignity. I mean, it was the indignity of, of you know, say how my grandmother was treated, or how Rosa Parks was treated, uh, or how Fannie Lou Hamer was treated, that, that actually was a motivating force uh, uh, in the movement. Um, and that kind of indignity can occur in other contexts as well. I mean, police violence, you know, uh, is maybe the, the counterpart of that in a, uh, today, where, you know, one can sit on the, wherever you want on the bus or go to a movie theater or a restaurant, but you can't walk down the street without being attacked uh, by police. So, uh, being in danger of that. Um, so, and I think the anger uh, as I observe it today, is very similar in terms of just the indignity of that, as well as the injury, uh, direct injury that's involved. Um, and often those themes are also, or almost always those themes are also very much related to the, the various structures of inequality uh, that allows that to happen, uh, that create that, that vulnerability. Um, and that's in the 1940s, 50s, it may have taken a different form, but it was also structural inequalities, uh, which I referred to earlier, uh, that put people in the position where they were vulnerable to various forms of indignity and even injury and, and even death, in fact. So uh, I don't see those, you know, as as necessarily certainly separate, but as in fact, in, you know, integrally related. Um, so issues of employment, issues of, you know, being able to make a, a, a decent life, uh, to get a decent education for your children and so forth, are all tied up together with those other, uh, 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 other issues. I think that was one of the things that I found quite striking here. It's that to the extent that you spend time on Dr. King here, a good bit of it is in it is about his time in Chicago when um, he was mobilizing around you know a range of issues, you know, including housing issues, schooling issues, right, and so on. Uh, and I thought that was just an incredibly interesting and powerful way of you know, from a different angle, kind of subverting these mythologized versions of him as an individual, and then by extension, the larger movement. Um, let, let me say uh, also about King, because I, you know, uh, to some extent, trying to do the, uh, tell the other stories in this, I spend a little less time on King than I, that may be warranted. Um, what's interesting about him is his own transformation. And early on in the book, I say, you know, that, that it was not King that made the movement, but the movement that made him. And that continues to be the case. So by the time you get to the Poor People's March in uh, 1968, that's a very different King than 
was, uh, you know, organizing, helped organizing the Montgomery bus boycott in uh, 1955. Um, and that, so that's a very, you know, interesting story that, you know, I don't give much attention to, but I just want to underscore that uh, it is uh, in some ways representative of the movement development uh, overall. That is his personal development. Mm -hmm. So it seems we have we have a question in the chat from Tracy, uh, Tracy Matthews. Can you talk some about personal indignities as compared to state sponsored and institutional violence? Um, and this is for someone who hasn't read the book yet. Yeah, um, I think um, that's a that's, that's, a, that's a, certainly an interesting question, uh, and I'll take a stab at it. What I think is different in a, a kind of personal indignity as experienced when, and I talk about this a, a bit in the early chapters of the book. The Jim Crow system was not simply a matter of separation. I mean, so the, the cry that comes later is for integration. And so it's, it's easy for people to think, well, it's a matter you don't want to be separated. It was a separation authorized a kind of brutality that, you know, uh, uh, that was daily, that was, if you will, in your face. Uh, and that, that, I think, was a tremendous motivator for people who otherwise may have felt powerless, but felt they had to respond. Um, uh, Structural kinds of indignities certainly are very important and people resented them, but in some ways they are, uh, how should I say, distant. They're not sort of in your face. I mean, let's, let's go to give you a, good, uh, 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 a concrete example. You're talking about a segregation on buses in the 1950s. Uh, let's take Birmingham, but let's take Rosa Parks. What segregation meant was not simply the separation of whites sitting in the front and blacks uh, sitting in the back, but that you know you would pay your fare at the beginning at the front of the bus. You'd have to get out of the bus, walk to the side door, and enter the, the door that lets you into the back of the bus, which stamps your you know, in your uh, untouchability, basically. Um, there was a sort of no man's land between the white sector of the bus and the black sector of the bus. And many of the instances of resistance, including Rosa Parks that come up, was that she was actually sitting in the part of the bus that was allocated for black passengers. But as more white passengers got on, the bus driver is authorized to force her to get up, she and some other people sitting in the same row, get up and surrender their seats to the white passengers who just got on. Which was, again, not unlike my grandmother back in 1944. Um, so, you know, that kind of, uh, so the system was set, of segregation, of separation, basically authorizes a kind of brutal uh, insult and on a daily basis. It's sort of, uh, it's, it's a kind of theater, in fact, the bus. I uh, uh, that from Robin Kelly, a very interesting uh, insight where you're showing it, uh, you know, your, uh, your inferiority. Not being able to, get a certain job is, you know, or other kinds of structural uh, 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 discrimination and oppression or housing in a certain neighborhood doesn't quite, while one resents that, it doesn't quite strike you in the same way. And I think that's very important in trying to understand how ordinary people, people who don't want to go to jail, don't want to, you know, uh, be beaten, don't want to get into trouble, 
but they they are in that kind of situation. Uh, basically, uh, as Rosa Parks put it, you know, I, I'd taken as much as I could take. I couldn't stand it anymore. She says that later on in describing her, you know, that moment. And I think that's the kind of distinction I want to want to make because I think it goes a long way to explaining how you get a mass movement, how you get, you know, thousands of people ready to challenge the system with no guarantee that they're going to win. But they just can't, you know, they cannot, as she said, I can't stand it anymore. I can't put up with this anymore. And that's a little different than, you know, the more, for lack of a better, better word, abstract, it's not quite the right word, um, uh, structural kinds of, of uh, oppression. And that's probably true to some extent today. I mean, that's why it is police brutality that often, you know, mobilizes people in a way that the basic economic injustices, which are palpable, do not, uh, or at least they're not, they will after you've been mobilized otherwise uh, to resist the system. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, obviously, I, I wish we could have much more time to talk about this, but I think our time is winding down. But thank you for this opportunity to talk. I think Marina is going to come back now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Hall, and thank you, Professor Johnson, for such a wonderful event. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, before we leave, please take a few moments to fill out a brief poll, uh, the link for which is in the chat. And thank you again for coming.